It's time for Tales of Terror, only on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. Now available from the Radio Theatre Workshop and Meriton Press, A Most Civil Proposal. A variation on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Darcy again tried to concentrate. It was coming to the conclusion that it was nigh impossible to determine just how his well-ordered and well-planned life had descended into the tumult and uncertainty that plagued him at present. Selecting a pen and pulling a sheet of stationery in front of him, he opened the inkwell, dipped his pen, and began. Miss Bennet, you must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. Available now through Audible. Please be advised that this episode contains potentially disturbing content. Check the show notes for trigger warnings before listening to our regularly scheduled episode. Welcome to the Agonal Dreams Podcast, Season 1 of Post-Apocalyptic Nightmare. Chapter 2, The Beginning of the End, Part 2. Yourself, right? Yes. I thought I was the only one left. You didn't see that group of bashers before? I'm assuming you mean those suffering from the madness? Ah, uh, no. I didn't. I was only passing through. I don't live here. Thankfully, everyone over in my city is dead. I mean, not thankfully. Uh, I mean, well, you know what I mean. Wait, where are we going? You can slow down now. Back to my group. Our car broke down, so I had to find a replacement. Oh, a group? That's great. How many people? Just two more. Uh, can I ask why you are covered in all that song cream? Kat turned her head slightly to look at the young man, sitting comfortably in the passenger seat. He hadn't even been looking in her direction. How have you not been wearing any? It's like 140 degrees outside. Come on now. It hasn't been that hot. Wait here. I need to prepare them for- What took you so long? I swear to God, I can't stand another minute alone with her. I'll leave her alone. She brought back the damn car as you wanted. And who's that? Cat, I specifically told you. Save it, Adrian. He's all right. Where's my gun? Uh, I accidentally dropped it. What? Don't worry. I was able to grab it. Just stay where you are. Who's this? I'm Ravi. Put the gun down. Adrian, what's the matter with you? He's handing it to you, not robbing us. <laughs> You're the only one of us who isn't covered in burns and blisters. What's your postcode? The sun? (laughs) It's much hotter where I'm from. (laughs) (laughs) This guy's okay. Here. Ravi smiled and handed him his weapon, but Adrian simply glared with embellished irritation and snatched it from him. You can trust me. Yeah, we'll see. Come on, 
Let's move everything over to this car. What's wrong with this other one? Does it matter? Well, if you want, I could take a look. I'm pretty handy. We don't have time for that. For once, I agree with Dr. Dingbat. Let's get the hell out of here. This place gives me the creeps. Well, if you could fix it, we could have two vehicles. I'm telling you, it's not worth our time. Oh yeah, I could definitely fix this. How would you fix those? Kat, Adrian and Ravi turn to look at the grotesque melted remains of the car's tires, bubbling in the heat of the midday sun. The smell of asphalt and rubber became overpowering as they all jumped back in horror. Ravi seemed slightly confused as he sniffed the air and frowned. What in the world? Does that happen where you come from too? Oh, uh, no. I guess not. Maybe the weather has been a little off. Understatement of the year. I told you, it wasn't worth it. Now let's go. Nothing. I'll just keep trying. No people mean no broadcasts. No music. I refuse to believe there's nobody else out there. We've picked up this guy already. The possibilities are endless. So what are you picturing? Someone getting up and going to work every day, even during the apocalypse? We could listen to music if you had a CD or a cassette tape. What century do you think this is? This car doesn't even have a CD player. I'm trying to sleep here. Can you scoot over? Oh, sorry. Stop. You're not going to find anything. <sighs> Stop acting like you know everything, Cat. We could play a game. Or sing. I love singing. Okay, let's play I Spy. I Spy Something Dead. Oh, look, over there. And there. And there. And there. Dude, your leg is touching mine. Aw, oh, sick. You're insanely sweaty. One of you girls need to switch seats with him. Not me. Adrian, stop it. I'm trying to drive. Yeah, stop distracting her because she sucks at it worse than me. Give me a break. I'm new at this. Do you want me to pull over somewhere? I think we need gas anyway. Might as well. I can't sleep with this guy all over me. It's not my fault. Next time, get something bigger than a four-door sedan. No motels. Look for a hotel. A nice one with five stars and a pool. Oh, what I wouldn't give to go swimming. This heat wave has got to give soon, you think? Wait, are we close to Fink Creek Avenue? Hmm? Oh yeah, we just passed it. Why? Watch the road, Cap. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, that mailbox really came out of nowhere. There should be a homeless shelter about two miles up. If memory serves me correctly, look for a big sign out front. I used to pass here every day when I took the bus to work. You've got to be kidding me. A Bednego house. Is this it? Yeah, that's the one. It should have at least some beds and maybe a soup kitchen. Oh, gross. It looks like a frickin' dump. I'd rather sleep in the car. This place is close to perfect for now. Should have everything we need for a few days and probably has a lot fewer bashers or whatever the hell you call them than a hotel would. I'm assuming this place didn't get many donations. Not from me. <laughs> <clears throat> but in all seriousness, this place did a lot for the community. Be grateful. Someday you're going to be begging for canned food when it's all gone. Unless one of you plans on going into the food processing business. We can eventually farm and hunt once we're settled. I guarantee you, it's much harder than it looks. It's actually not. If I can do it, anyone can. You actually shoot things with that thing? With my crossbow? Oh yeah, of course. He's awesome with it. I don't get it. How? 
Adrian stared at Ravi from across the table, while the two women watched with curiosity. He slowly brought up three fingers and wiggled them in Ravi's direction, who appeared as if he hadn't noticed. His milky-coloured eyes stared into stark nothingness. Kat had been frightened when she first saw them, but now, looking at them in the candlelit room, they just seemed so mysterious and ancient. Ravi shifted uncomfortably in his chair when nobody spoke. Go ahead. Ask me. Can you see? I can, but I mostly rely on my other senses, like hearing and smell. I've learned to adapt. Smell? Yes. Mostly smell, actually. Those things, the ones killing everyone, their smell is horrible. Well... I'm sure we can safely assume that personal hygiene isn't very high on their to-do list. I mean, all they do is kill. I don't think I've ever seen one eat, let alone take a shower. The smell... It's different, though. It's... It's beyond body odor. Try to describe it to us, if you can. Hmm. It's... Hard to explain. It's... It's like they're already rotten from the inside. Worse than regular dead bodies. I can definitely tell the difference. The smell sticks to the inside of my nose and just stays there, burning and stinging my nostrils. Kind of like that sensation you get when you bite into a raw onion. But it helps when I'm trying to use my crossbow and I can't really see them. I just follow that stinging rot. I can't believe you've been managing out there all on your own. It has been lonely. That was the worst part. What happened to your family? Jenny, that's a sensitive subject. It's okay. I don't mind answering. My family is back home. Way, way far away from here. Once communications went down, well, I only hope they are doing better over there than we are over here. Don't mind me. I've got to get some sleep. I've been up for like 72 hours now. Don't bother me. I'm locking the door. I'm dead serious. Figure it out amongst yourselves who's staying out on guard and what shift. I'm too tired to micromanage. (laughs) That's a first. Adrian, seriously? I'm sorry, Kat. I just can't stay awake any longer. You guys can keep talking about memories that make you sad without me. I'm gonna lie down. And don't let anyone, and I mean anyone, inside. No exceptions. We know, we know. Jeez, what's his problem? He is a really mean guy, am I right? He's dead serious. He feels responsible for us. It's a heavy burden to bear. And we didn't exactly start out on good terms. Well, I'm tired of listening to him barking orders all the time. Tell him that you want to be the leader of this group now. Yeah, you saved me from that horde back there. I would follow you for sure. Guys, I appreciate the gesture, but Adrian has done a lot for us. He let us join him, and we shouldn't forget that. Is that a basher knocking like that? Don't go near the door! Hello? I'm just going to look through the blinds. Don't let them know we're in here. Open the door! Open the door! No! Piss off! I need help! Please! She sounds really upset. What does she look like? What? Now you're saying you can't just sniff her and see if she's normal? I can't smell through walls! We can't risk it! Oh god! You guys, we have to let her in! Hurry! Hurry up! They're coming! They're coming! Just let her in! We can't! Shut the door, shut the door, quick, quick! It's okay. You're safe now. Make her shut up, you know he's gonna hear her. Oh, you're... Here, sit down. Sit down, relax. Oh, here comes another one. Oh, wow. You are really huge. What are you doing? Two two and a half months. What's your name? 
Uh, Heather. Okay, Heather. Just keep talking. Talk through the contractions. She doesn't smell like one of them. She's safe. Oh, shut up. What do we do? What do we do? Oh, it's too soon. I can't stop them. Just keep talking, Heather. Breathe deep. In through your nose, out through your mouth. Yes, yes. There you go. Great job. Oh, I need pain medication. Give me something, please. This isn't a pharmacy, lady. Oh, here comes another one. Hey, Heather. Let's go back in time. What are you talking about? Remember to keep breathing. Deep, deep. Hold. Exhale. Good. Now, tell us about the last thing you remember while being at your home. I, I can't. I can't remember anything. Shh, shh, now. Yes, you can. Breathe deep and exhale. Now clear your mind and remember. Take us through your last memory at home. I was watching news coverage of the storm in my room. I was, I was getting ready for my shift. I was a waitress at a local diner. My feet, oh, they were so swollen. But I pulled on my shoes. It took forever because of this inner tube. My mom, she, uh, she came into my room and she asked me something. But I, I couldn't hear her. My TV was on. I always kept it real loud. I tried to drown out all the... She was always fighting with her boyfriend, you know. I was tired of all the noise. My mom was looking at me. She just kept on staring at me, like, with a weird look on her face. I figured she probably just wanted to argue with me right before I left for work so I'd have a shitty day. She was always doing stupid crap like that. She just kept on looking at me. I was ignoring her. I even turned up the volume on the TV. Most days she would just scream at me from the hallway, and after she felt like she had humiliated me enough, she would leave and slam the door behind her. You're such a disappointment. Wasting your life. But this time was different. She wasn't screaming, she was just leaned up against my door frame, staring at me. She wouldn't stop. I didn't see what she wanted either. Chairs and subways. Mom, what As do you want? Today, Eastern Standard Time. Heather's mother didn't answer. She just stood there, grinning in the doorway, holding a fillet knife in her left hand. Slowly she twirled it around and around with the butt of the blade within her palm. Heather cautiously turned down the TV. What? She was thinking. She just. Mom? What are you doing? What are you doing? Put that down! Stop! 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 That I, I left and I never stop putting that house again. That's awful. You don't have to keep talking about it. Right, Kat? That's enough, right? I'm not like those other people. The killing ones. We can't just kick her out. She can stay here, right, Kat? Yeah, I think so. Adrian's not going to like it, but... Who cares? 
that guy shouldn't be leading this group. You should be. You actually care about people. Oh, you guys! What's happening? Heather leaned over against the table. Her hands shook as she clutched her bloated belly in pain. A small trickle of clear fluid began to slide down her leg as she squealed through a painful contraction. <laughs> you are having your baby right now? That's really bad timing. I can't control it! I've been having contractions for days! Ravi, you go wake Adrian. Tell him it's an emergency. Tell him the whole building is on fire if you have to. Just do whatever you gotta do to get him up. On it! Ginny, gather as many towels and linens as you can. Check every closet. If you see any first aid kits, anything at all, bring those too. And scissors. A sharp, clean pair. No rust. Put a pot of water outside the window there. It's not hot enough to boil, but it should get hot enough to kill the germs in it. Heather, try to breathe deeply. In through your nose, out through your mouth. Did you take any birthing classes? No, of course I didn't! Okay. Breathe deeply. In through your nose, out through your mouth. Heather squeezed the side of the dining table through another fiery contraction. Kat grabbed Heather's hands and attempted to lead her to one of the bedrooms to be more comfortable through her labour. Still, Heather only made it five steps before she began to shake in agony. Kat pulled off her jacket and folded it three times, creating a makeshift pillow for Heather's head. She knew they wouldn't make it any further, so Kat gently guided her down to the floor where they stood. Have you ever done this before? Yes, well, I... I've watched it, at least. Christian! Christian, his name is Christian! If anything happens to me, make sure you know his name. Nothing is going to happen to you. We're going to help you. Adrian, we need you! Heather, don't look at them. Focus on me. A fist exploded through the window, followed by two more in quick succession in a matter of seconds. Kat's eyes widened in horror as two sinewy men, covered in scars and boils, burst through the open glass. One landed on a large shard that jutted out of the side of his neck, and the other rolled across the floor several yards from where she kneeled. Instinctively, Kat shielded Heather from the figures, puffing out her chest menacingly as the men shook off the pieces of glass and stumbled their way to their feet, locking their dead eyes on her as their target. <laughs> Secure this place? Kat turned her attention back to Heather, who was growing weaker in her arms. A word flashed in her brain as she watched the carpet surrounding them deepen from beige to copper. Hemorrhage. Kat didn't know how she thought of the word or what exactly it meant, but fear and desperation shrouded it in her mind. Oh my god, there's so much blood. Heather, stop pushing. Wait for Adrian, please. Jenny, hurry with those towels. Adrian, get out here. I can't stop it! I can't control it! Breathe and look at me. Don't look at them. Kat tugged the small 22 pistol that Adrian had gifted her out of her waistband. Her trembling crimson-drenched fingers tried pulling the slide back with her thumb and forefinger like he'd shown her. But the spring remained frozen in place. Her fear and the slipperiness of the blood did nothing but waste time and give the bashers ample time to get on their feet. Heather grabbed Kat's hand and squeezed so hard that her knees would have buckled if she hadn't already been on them. I can't get a clear shot of them. The room is too dark. Ravi shot his crossbow at the basher, but it missed and whistled through the air, striking a nearby wall. Shoot at it again. I'm trying. Ravi, go get Adrian. Jenny, grab your gun off the table and shoot them. I don't know how to use a pistol. You can do it. I know you can. Adrian showed you how. I can't use mine. There's too much blood on me. I, I can't get a grip. What if I accidentally shoot you? Jenny, please. I can't leave Heather here on the floor. Jenny watched in horror as the pair of feral bashers tackled Kat to the ground. She knew she should grab the pistol and kill them, but her feet were frozen in paralyzing fear. Ravi attempted to drag the birthing Heather to the opposite end of the room, but one of the bashers reached out and knocked the crossbow out of his hands and sent it flying. Kat screamed and shielded her face from the basher's iron fists. Pain radiated from her forehead as one of them sliced open her skin like a letter opener through an envelope. She heard Adrian's thunderous footsteps pounding down the hallway towards the commotion. 
and prayed he would reach them in time. Smash their fucking brains in! <coughs> Already dead! No need to waste any more energy. Where's my baby? Oh, for crying out loud. Ravi aimed his crossbow at the broken window as four more bashers forced themselves through the broken glass. Adrian aimed his pistol as he waited for the opportunity to annihilate them using as few rounds as possible. All eyes turned to Heather, weak, pale, drenched in blood, but protectively holding her newborn son to her chest. She narrowed her eyes at the bashers. Don't you fucking touch him. Adrian and Ravi rounded up the three remaining bashers and began to execute them one by one. The newborn's cries echoing long and loud and Jenny hurried to the open window, terrified more would be drawn to the sound. As she looked for something to cover the window in desperation, a thin, shadowy figure emerged. Jenny froze as she saw a young woman, dripping wet, silently slip down through the opening. She avoided all the shards of glass, jutting upward and tinged with red basher blood. The figure put up her hand and the room fell deathly silent. The remaining basher that was still alive became calm, docile and obedient. Adrian, Ravi and Jenny watched in horror as the figure glossed across the room. She left a trail of water in her wake. The only sound in the room was the baby, who continued to cry for his mother. Adrian tried to raise his pistol, but his muscles were taut, and he found himself unable to move anything other than his diaphragm. As the young woman neared towards the candlelight, they could see her ebony hair clinging to her body like seaweed, drenched in liquid they could only assume was water. She smiled as she drew nearer to Heather and the child, and Jenny gasped soundlessly as the shadow woman plucked the infant from Heather's arms. Heather frowned, but she too was unable to control her own faculties. In horrific slow motion, they watched the wet shadow woman beckon to the remaining basher, and he rose from his position between Ravi and Adrian. Without another word, the two were gone. Adrian's muscles relaxed, and he lowered his weapon. He looked over at Ravi, who gave him an acknowledging glance. Please, please give him to me. In a pool of her blood, Heather lay on the floor and shook her head, confused. Jenny rushed to her side and attempted to comfort her. Still, in no time at all, Heather leaned backward, losing consciousness altogether. I don't even know what to say. None of this would have happened if you obeyed my direct orders. Really? After everything that just happened, that's honestly what you want to go with? We have to go after them! Ravi ran to the front door and flew it open hysterically. He ran out into the street, but he saw no sign of the wet shadow woman or the basher. This is why all of you need to keep your weapons on you at all times. Adrian threw Jenny a particularly dirty look. And not be afraid to use them. I'm going to ignore you for once. Oh my god, Cat! Cat! Is she breathing? Ravi re-entered the shelter with a pained expression on his face. We can't just let her take the baby. We have to go after them. Cat lay on the floor, sprawled out next to the two dead bashers. Her eyes were closed, and her chest rose and fell in shallow waves. The thin gash now ran the length of her left eyebrow. Heather's blood spooled all around her and made her look like she was part of a crime scene. Is that all hers? The blood? Won't be able to tell until we get her cleaned up, but I think she fell face first in this puddle when they tackled her. Who the hell is this, by the way? Her name is Heather. They took her baby. Oh, my God, what are we gonna do? Cat let her in. I mean, she had to. She was practically giving birth outside the front door of the shelter. She brought those things to us, all her screaming and moaning. You're lucky this place isn't swarming right now. Wow. I'm speechless. You really have no heart. 
Are you not listening to me? We have to go now! A brain is more valuable than a heart these days. Is Kat gonna be okay? I'm gonna have to clean her cut, but I think she's fine. She just passed out when she hit her head. Robbie, come here and hold this girl down for me. No! Don't kill her! I'm not gonna kill her. I need to give her something for the pain. She needs a few stitches. Hand me one of those towels there. Do we have any clean water? Here. Kat, are you injured? She's out. Listen, you guys. We have to go now. Ravi, listen to yourself. That thing. She took him. They're gone. You saw what she did. We couldn't even move if she didn't let us. She's powerful. The baby is gone. I'm sorry. I'll just go after them myself. Ravi pulled on his jacket and slung his crossbow over his shoulder. As he put his hand on the doorknob, he looked over his shoulder at Adrian and Jenny. Betrayal flashed across his face as he knew that he would be going out on his own if he left. I need to stitch her up. Jenny nodded and held Heather's hand, despite her already being unconscious. Adrian left the room briefly to retrieve his duffel bag. Well, aren't you leaving, you said? Get on with it already. With his hand still on the doorknob, Ravi watched Adrian return to the room with his bag. He checked on Kat as she laid sprawled out on the carpet to ensure she was still breathing before returning to Heather's side. He snapped on a pair of latex gloves and hurriedly stitched up Heather's torn perineum. Jenny looked away and winced, but continued holding Heather's hand. Next, he swiftly moved over to Kat before cleaning up her face and applying a loose-fitting bandage over her eye. She said his name was Christian. Would you mind helping me take them back to her room? Let's take Heather first. Be gentle now. Grab her feet. Ravi was still angry, but he nodded and placed his crossbow on the table before lifting Heather off the floor. She felt so light in his arms, and her face looked so peaceful. This window needs to be boarded up. Jenny, can you handle that? Yeah, I can do that. Why did this happen? This is a new world, Robbie. It's not safe, and it's definitely not fair. This is our new reality, so you better get used to it. Death and misfortune will not discriminate between the young or the old, and we need to prepare ourselves. We have no choice but to push through it. That's the only chance we have at surviving this. If you can't, then you might as well get the hell out of here now. I can't just shrug my shoulders and say, Oh well, he mattered, Adrian. He was a living baby. And now he's gone. We could have protected him if we just tried harder. The men entered one of the bedrooms and placed Heather in one of the two beds. She began to snore softly and lie still on top of the blankets. He didn't indulge in Ravi's accusatory opinion. He simply walked out of the room back into the main room to retrieve Cat. This time he didn't ask for Ravi's help and simply hefted Cat up over his own shoulder and returned to the same bedroom. He deposited her onto the opposite bed from Heather's and shut the door. Trying to talk some sense into him. I'm going to clean myself up. I'll see what I can do. There we go. Ravi, just stop for a minute. He was so beautiful, wasn't he? Yes. All babies are beautiful. This world isn't safe for him, Ravi. You know that. We could have protected him. We could have... Did you have babies of your own? In the time before? Me? No. I never had any babies. I always wanted to. I didn't either. But maybe we can someday. When the world is safe again. Heather is going to be devastated when she wakes up. We will help her through it. Adrian returned, wearing an oversized t-shirt and Bermuda shorts. Jenny smirked, but didn't quip. You were right about the lousy donations, Ravi. Well, at least they are clean, right? Adrian nodded and ran a hand through his hair. How are they? Live at least, but uh, there's something else. When I went back in there to put some towels under Heather, this fell out of her pocket. 
A slender, yellowed hypodermic needle was placed on the dining room table. Neither Ravi nor Jenny spoke as Adrian explained his concerns. She's a risk to our survival. Does nobody's life have meaning to you? There's so few of us left as it is. Look, somebody has to make the tough decisions here. I'm trying to do what's best for our group. You're a doctor! Make her better! It's not that simple. So, what are you suggesting that doesn't involve us leaving Heather to die here alone? <clears throat> uh, well, we'll need to stay here a little longer than I had anticipated. But if we can get her to detox and stay sober, she can stay with us. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad. What's the catch? We can't do anything to potentially upset her. We have to keep her calm and on track towards sobriety, or she's just going to relapse. Just spit it out already, Adrian. Whatever the hell just happened out there. That basher taking her baby away, it's a traumatic memory. And if there's any hope for her to try and get clean, we have to make her forget it happened. What? Are you insane? That's impossible. I'm no expert on giving birth, but I'm pretty sure you can't just forget you did it. Look, I wasn't entirely truthful before. You were right about some things. The military. It had access to things. Incredible things. Things civilians only dreamed of. Like what? Adrian slowly pulled out a small brown vial from his shirt pocket. There were seven small white pills in the bottom of the tube. He shook the bottle three times before showing it to Ravi and Jenny. What are those? In layman's terms, military-grade memory erasers. Bullshit. That's not real. Why would you have those? That's not important. The point is they were created to replace traumatic memories in the brain, mostly for victims of PTSD. If we don't talk about it, she won't remember it. No, 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 no. It's wrong. What other choice do we have? If she survives the heroin withdrawal over the next few days, I'll start giving her these. The temporary amnesia takes a few days to begin. After that, the replacement memories take a few weeks to permanently root themselves in the brain and completely erase the traumatic memories. And then? Then we'll be in the clear. Did you notice the label was ripped off the front of the bottle? I think those were his pills. But why would he need a memory eraser? Well, you've made it through another episode. Join us again next time for another chapter of Post-Apocalyptic Nightmare. Starring Journey Brown St. Tell, Andrew Quintero, Emily Husband, Esther Payne, Shinmebi Umjaku Brown, and me, Allegra Rodriguez Shivers. This episode also featured the voice talents of Greg Thomas and Michelle Kane. Story written by Courtney Holloway, sound designed by Christopher Jarvis at the Radio Theater Workshop, original music composed by Bradley Parsons. For full access to the show notes, check us out online and don't forget to head over to wherever you listen to podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. Hey, Billy, why do you look so down? Aw, oh, Dad, I got a computer, a PlayStation, and a barn full of iguanas, and I'm still bored. <sighs> Gee, Billy, when I was your age, I would read lots of stories in pulp magazines. Oh, with stories of weird adventure and fantasy, horror, satire, and lots of action. Wow, that sounds great, Dad. Yeah, I sure wish there was something like that right now. <laughs> <laughs> there is Daddy-O! Who are you? I'm Dr. Mary Von Rocksprocket, host of the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour, and now there's... Yeah? Twisted Pulp Magazine! <laughs>
What's that, Doctor? Why, it is a return to greatness! Available on all your digital devices! That is what it is! Look! Whoa! Dad, this looks awesome! Exciting and, dare I say it, very unwholesome. You definitely have that right, my good man! Ha ha! Ha ha Thanks, Dr. Mary! My pleasure, Billy! And just between you and me, I am not sure that this man is really your father. Bye! Dad? Uh, uh, just read your Twisted Pulp magazine, Billy. Twisted Pulp magazine! Available in dark alleyways behind meth labs everywhere! Or at digitalvaudeville.com! That is D-I-G-I-T-A-L-V-A-U-D-E-V-I-L-L-E dot com!